Welcome to In The Workshop and I'm going to cover quite a few topics in this episode. Running a small steam engine on the bench, a look at the number of parts required for working on radio control models, replacing a broken transmitter switch and the correct way to fit servos. Today my friend Rob and myself are painting the outside of the workshop and when he arrived he brought with him a small steam engine. So after making a couple of connectors for the engine I piped it up to my new distribution unit for compressed air. He was supposed to bring more engines than this with him, but he forgot. And here it is sat on the bench just as he bought it. It's very well made and it could be a microcosm engine, I'm not sure. He was thinking about putting it in a boat, but I proceeded to talk him out of that. Especially as in the same deal he bought a microcosm twin cylinder engine with a water pump and a PM Research TVR1A. In this part of the video I'm going to show how you can use a steam tap on the exhaust to control the speed of an oscillating cylinder engine. The engine knocks slightly at lower speeds but when you speed it up it does this. This is a very impressive piece of engineering to run at this speed and as smoothly as it does. The black oil that's appearing on the port face tells me that this engine hasn't done a lot of running and the cylinder and the port face is not fully broken in. And where's the black oil coming from? Well it isn't black to start with, it's coming from the pipe. I always put some oil in the airline before I run a steam engine. But even in this condition the engine runs very well. It's unusual to see a gland nut fitted to an oscillating cylinder engine. I like the idea of the large mass of brass in the centre for a bit more inertia. As a general rule with a miniature steam engine, when the oil retains its original colour, then the engine is fully run in. With an oscillating cylinder engine, depending on which inlet or outlet you connect the airline or steam line to, this controls the direction that the engine runs in. To use this engine successfully as a power unit in a model boat, it would really need to be fitted with a regulator to control the steam admission by radio control. And if the boat stopped in the middle of the lake, it wouldn't be self-starting anyway. I really do recommend twin cylinder steam engines for radio controlled model boats. And now onto the subject of radio control. This is not a steamboat, this is my laser yacht. And if you've never had a go at radio controlled yachting, I highly recommend it. For radio control, whether it be aircraft, boats or cars, you need quite a lot of equipment that you don't need for steam engines. Pretty much most of the stuff here is for my radio control aeroplane, and I didn't put my transmitter in the shot either. You need a battery charger, an electric starter, fuel, batteries for the radio receiver, or if the motive power is electric, you do of course need a motor battery. For the job I'm doing, I need some canopy glue, some 5 minute epoxy, a fuel tank, more servos, a power panel. The list goes on and on, but it's great fun. It's time now to clear all of this stuff away, because I need to use the workbench to repair a transmitter that I recently bought. As you can see, the green top switch is the one that came out of it and it's broken. When I looked at this, I was slightly concerned because the switch has a circuit board soldered to it. The small plug on the circuit board has three pins and as you can see there are three terminals on the switches. The first thing I needed to do was unsolder the original switch. I heated the parts and then I used a spring loaded solder sucker to remove the solder. Before anybody writes in to tell me that my soldering iron is no good, please be aware that the end of it has been ground to a very fine point so it's not as clumsy as it looks. I would normally use a solder sucker because it quickly extracts the solder from around the joint but a few viewers recommended this stuff, it's solder wick, and I didn't know I had any, but I found some. I think I prefer the solder sucker machine rather than this, because the joint does get very hot. Even though the solder braid acts as a heat shunt, it doesn't extract the solder quite as quickly as the air pump. In order to fit this circuit board to the new switch, I had to grind the terminals down a little bit. And here, I'm re-soldering it. And I'm sorry that in the video you can't see the sharp point on the soldering iron. There was a bit of a problem with this job though, the circuit board was double sided and I just could not remove the solder from the inside part of the circuit board so when I pulled it off the switch it pulled the track off the board. 
This wasn't too much of a problem, except that I had to solder a very fine wire from the rear of the centre pin of the connector to the centre pin of the switch, and this worked out OK. After checking the continuity with my test meter, everything was OK, so I put the switch back in the transmitter. This is a Futaba 9-zap transmitter, and I love the way it's made. I've fitted it with a 2.4 GHz module in the back. I've already shown the way I fitted it in a previous video. In this clip I'm binding the module to a DSM2 receiver. And everything works OK, which is more than I can say for my video camera when that broke. That's in bits in a box in the studio. This job was successful though, and now I can refit the receiver into where it's going. Into my laser yacht. I've fitted a very heavy duty battery in this boat. It's a 6 volt nickel metal hydride battery and its capacity is 4300 mAh. I'm using a 6 volt battery just for the speed and power as I need plenty of power for the large sail winch and also the rudder's quite big too. Using a small piece of gaffer tape I stuck a battery condition meter on top of the battery and replaced the cap. Here you can see the speed of movement that's available by using 6 volts. Now, after many years, my laser yacht is ready to sail, and I will do this as soon as it stops raining. I wanted to make a video showing how to fit servos. In this case, I'm fitting servos to a plastic servo tray, and I need to cut out all the parts, but please be aware you do not cut out the centre bit between the two main servos. Just about every time I work on a model that someone sent me that's fitted with radio control, the servo installation is wrong. Whether you're fitting servos to a plastic servo tray like this one, or screwing them down onto wooden bearers, the principle is identical. Each servo needs four grommets, whether they're this type, or the individual ones. And this is the part that most people get wrong. You fit the metal eyelets from underneath like this. The reason that the larger part of the eyelet is underneath is so that when you tighten the screw, the eyelet cannot be pushed into the wooden or plastic bearer. Fitting servos into a servo tray really is quite different to fitting to wooden bearers, but the principle is identical. When fitting servos to wooden bearers, if you notice, the screws that are supplied with the servo have a specially shaped head with a flange on it. The whole point of the grommet mounting system is shock absorption from whatever's vibrating in the model. After fitting the servos into the servo tray, I removed the arms because when I power up these servos, if the arms move in the wrong direction, they will foul each other and may damage the gears. For this application, these two servos are for the rudder and elevator, and then I fitted the third one, which operates the throttle on the engine. And that's it for this episode, and now you know how to do it. May all your servo operations be successful. Stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.